having just seen his father lying in a pool of blood on the ground, with a gunshot bleeding from his foot, in shock, as officers said, heavily medicated with fentanyl, officers wasted no time at all accusing Alexander Jackson of killing his family. And although they interrogated him for over seven hours, it took about 35 minutes before they decided that Alexander Jackson was their suspect. And Officer Matt Denlinger and Sarah Lucina had never even stepped foot on the crime scene. You'll see in those seven and a half hours that Alexander Jackson never wavered in telling officers what happened to him that morning. He told them over 13 different ways that it was not him. But charging Alex was the easiest route for officers. And as the state said, you will hear about Alexander Jackson having a good childhood growing up. As a, at a young age, he participated in Boy Scouts. He received 34 merit badges to lead him on to become an Eagle Scout on November 17th in 2017. You will hear that at 17 years old, Alex led an Eagle project where he helped restore a safe Cedar Rapids heritage home and had what's mentioned in the Gazette. You'll also hear that throughout high school, Alexander Jackson was a member of the band, a member of the marching band, and where he played the flute. You'll hear he graduated from Kennedy High School in 2019 and was accepted into the University of Iowa that fall. You're going to hear that Alex was raised by loving parents. He had great relationships with his mother and his father both, spending time with them, helping them out around the house. You're going to hear about how the entire family spent time together, catching up over dinner and watching movies together. You'll especially hear how Alex loved playing video games with his father, and they did, on occasion, go to the shooting range. And on that night of June 14th, you're going to hear exactly that, that the night before, Alex was with his family, having dinner, watching movies. Shortly after, Alex goes to his bedroom and retrieves this 22 Browning rifle. And that way, him and his father can clean this rifle. Um, they had plans to go to the shooting range that next day. So after a while, you're going to hear that Alex leaves his dad with this gun, goes and plays video games with his friends, and then goes to bed on the porch as he normally and regularly has in the past. As an Eagle Scout, that's not surprising to want to sleep outside. And thankfully, he didn't sleep in his room that night. Because as around, as you will hear, around 8, 10 that morning, Alex woke up to multiple gunshots. And scared, he finally goes downstairs to see what was happening. And as he approaches those stairs, he sees a man messing with his dad's gun. You'll hear his first instinct was to run towards that man, pushing him trying to get this gun away from him. But the man wouldn't let go of the gun. And during this struggle and this incident, Alex is shot one time into his foot, causing it to immediately shoot out blood. Alex gets a hold of the gun, and the man runs back out the door, leaving the door open. Now you're going to hear that Alex's first thought was to call 911, which he does. He couldn't stand or walk, so Alex crawls to his bedroom to find a tourniquet to put around his foot. Police arrive, and they place him in the ambulance where they immediately give him fentanyl. Alex breaks down in tears, and one of the first things he asks is if his father is okay. He's hoping that his father is in an ambulance as well, and you'll hear him ask the ambulance that. Now you'll hear at the, off at the hospital that officers begin their interrogation. One of the first things they do is read Alex his Miranda rights without Alex even asking for an attorney. Alex freely speak speaks with officers. And as I said, only 35 minutes into that interview, they begin directing their questions towards Alex as though he's the suspect in killing his family. They ask him, do they ever do anything to upset you? You're going to hear that for six more hours, 
officers go on this fishing expedition with Alex, accusing him of killing his mother and his father and his sister. While on fentanyl, while he's bleeding, while he had just been shot and saw his father lying in blood, you will hear officers attempt to catch Alex in a lie for the next six hours. Officers will accuse Alex of having mental health issues. They'll tell him he needs to go to a mental ward. They tell him he needs a social worker without any proof of that. You'll hear officers begin talking about his home life, starting with accusing him of dropping out of college. Officers aren't thinking that it's June 15th. Alex is at home that day because it's summer break and he's not in college at the time. You'll even hear officers continually put Alex down about his struggles in school, going so far as to saying, a guy with no job and no girlfriend should have all the time in the world to class classes with a B. At this time, students everywhere were struggling with school, online schooling, because it was during and after COVID. You'll then hear officers begin to tell Alex how his dad's unhappy with him and how his grades aren't that great and they don't have the best of relationships. And then they use the interrogation tactic of telling Alex that his sister is his parents' favorite child. At one point, you'll even help hear officers ask him his sister's password to her phone, suggesting, is it dad's favorite number one? But you'll hear, officer, you'll hear Alex tell officers how his dad's proud of him, how his parents didn't have a favorite, and that they loved them both equally. You'll hear when that doesn't work, they then move on to his relationship with his sister. Tell me about this relationship with your sister. And as brothers and sisters are, Alex says, I mean, we're brother and sister. We're not the closest, but she is my sister. Their response, with no reasoning at all, I can tell you don't like your sister. And you'll hear that after all this questioning, after speaking with neighbors, talking to friends, going through home records, that officers found no evidence at all that Alex did not get along with his family or with his parents. There's no history of mental illness. You'll hear nothing except he enjoyed band. He enjoyed scouts. He was respectful to his teachers, respectful to his parents. No one who knew them said anything about this family was unusual. Then they continue to question Alex. You'll hear that officers tell him, you told the 911 operator that your mother and sister was dead. Alex is adamant that that's untrue. He did not know the condition of his mother and sister. He hadn't seen them that morning. You'll hear for yourselves in the 911 call that will be played that Alex never once mentions his mother or his sister. He says that he's been shot and a family member has shot. He's only referring to his father who he saw lying in blood. You'll hear that officers tried to imply that his mom's blood would be on him or his body somewhere. You'll hear that officers took multiple swabs from Alex, multiple swabs from areas around his body, that they tested different pieces of, um, of clothing that he had on. And officers found no other blood on Alex except from his own body. You'll hear that officers found two separate prints on that rifle that was on the scene. One belonging to Alex, the other print belonging to an unidentified person. You will also hear that none of the victim's blood was found on Alex no matter how close officers claim that he was to the victims when they were shot. You'll also hear that none of the victim's blood was found on the gun either. In fact, you're going to hear that no blood and no DNA was found on that gun or the muzzle of that gun, despite Alex telling them that blood shot out of his foot when he was shot, which makes it very difficult to not find blood on this gun. You'll also hear that the officers didn't even bother to test whether there are any fingerprints or DNA on these shell casings, on the bullets later removed from that gun, or from any bullets that were dropped on the floor in the living room. You're also going to hear the officers confront Alex about being on his phone at 6.50 a.m. 
when Alex had told officers he was asleep at eight, an hour and a half later. What was Alex Googling that morning? Who played the emperor in a Star Wars movie? That is not the search engine of someone who is about to kill their family. You'll also hear that an officer, as you heard, took his canine, who was well-trained in tracking scent, disturbed vegeta vegetation, and explosive detection. He took this canine on the property, but not the entire property. As you'll see, the canine was never taken out the basement to the right side, over on brick and concrete. You'll see from the officer's body cam, to the right would be the logical path that an intruder would enter and exit among the rest of the area of the yard. And additionally, you're going to hear from a canine expert that it would be difficult for a canine to track a crime scene where multiple officers, multiple ambulance, and multiple people from fire had been all over the property. And you're going to hear that dogs cannot track on brick and concrete. Lastly, along with that, you are going to hear that officers accuse Alex of interrupting the recording of the ring cameras. They say to him, how soon before this happened did you mess with the cameras? At what point did you unplug the cameras? And again, you're going to hear that that was untrue because officers downloaded those videos. All four cameras were working. The garage and the front door showed the police activity. However, the motion detector on the backyard camera only detected a limited area of the backyard. It detected to the extreme left of the house. That camera was on the front porch of the bedroom, the parent's balcony bedroom. The same area Alex activated it while he was doing a chore for the, his mother the night prior. Not one camera had been touched, as the officers alluded to. You're going to hear that Alexander Jackson's fingerprints were not on that camera. You're going to hear that it was a wireless camera, so there's no way to unplug it. And you're going to hear that it was battery operated, and that the battery was still inside of this camera when officers took it. You're going to hear, based on the questioning of officers to Alex, that he appeared to only know about the cameras in the front and the garage. Those are two major pieces of evidence in this case that would rule out an intruder coming into the house. And in no way did they rule out an intruder. This was a home invasion with an unknown motive. An intruder who escaped out the back door and left it open. The evidence will show that the police made very little to no effort in this investigation. Alexander Jackson was the fourth victim in this case. There's no doubt this is a tragedy, no doubt at all. Do not compound this tragedy by convicting Alexander Jackson of murder. Thank you.